So first off, I'm going to tell you a couple of things about why this class on Cuba and why me. On the one hand, I lead the Cuba International Field Program, which is a study about program of the New School, uh, which runs nine weeks in the summer every year. This year in La Habana. This year it's not going to run because of COVID-19. And the reason why I think today's lecture and the following lecture are relevant uh, are twofold. Number one, because I profoundly believe that knowing Cuba because of the unique relationship between Cuba and the U.S. makes of U.S. citizens better citizens of their own country. And number two, because it allows breaking down socialism between theory and experience. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you look at socialism from the post-colony, uh, it allows you to think that when theory becomes prescriptive, it mutes and metastasizes into ideology. It begins to wither. The post-colony can show how socialism can actually ought to be a tactical, not a teleological diagnostic, at least that's how I see it, which does not imply, therefore, an a priori framing of the real, but it becomes more of a methodology for action. Uh, and of course, Cuba allows us to say something that I'm sure has been shared in the class before, uh, that socialism is very different across time and space, and context, the specificity of context is crucial to the understanding of socialism. Socialism in the Soviet Union has nothing to do with socialism in Cuba or in North Korea for that matter. <clears throat> Today's class is going to be uh, before the Cuban Revolution. Everything that led to the Cuban Revolution and uh, I would like to use two framing words. Uh, for the post-colony, for the colony and post-colony, which would be uh, post-colonial, colonial and post-colonial unthinkability vis-a-vis -vis imperial invisibility. And we'll see what we mean by that later on in the discourse. Uh, and certainly the issue of, uh, in the Cuban case, like in most cases, nationalism coming much more before socialism. I'm gonna give you a brief, because the readers could not do this job, obviously, I'm gonna give you a very short uh, synopsis of Cuba's history and why that matters. Uh, first off, Cuba originates thanks to piracy. That's the origin of Cuba's wealth, right? Uh, you know about the discovery of the Americas, of course, the Spanish vessels loaded with silver, gold, and, and other goods going back to Europe were attacked by Dutch, French, and British pirates or buccaneers. Therefore, the Spanish fleet, uh, the Spanish uh, crown decided to assemble the Spanish fleet in the port of La Habana at the beginning of the 16th century. And that made of La Habana one of the wealthiest cities in the world because they had a fleeting population that doubled its size. Six months out of the year, La Habana was twice the size that it normally was. In 1760, La Habana was the third largest city in the Americas, behind Mexico City and Lima, was bigger than any city in the US, including New York City, which was at the time 63,000 inhabitants. Why is that relevant? Because it tells you that wealth and nation building shape themselves in very different ways. Cuba's idea of the nation has two fundamental phases before the, 19th, the 20th century. The first one is as uh, the colonial avant-garde of the Spanish crown. And the second one is intimately, so as you can see, the first origin of Cuba's wealth is not related to sugar, which is what Cuba was known for, for the most of the 19th century and large part of the 20th century. The second is uh, related to the Haitian Revolution, which is probably the most important revolution uh, of modern history that I can think of, probably much more relevant than the French, the American, or the Russian Revolution for a host of reasons. <clears throat> 
I borrow the trope of unthinkability from the work of Michel Rostroyot, who talks about the Haitian Revolution as being something unthinkable as it happened, because the black body was not conceived as able to have an agency in and of itself. I'm going to talk briefly about the Haitian Revolution because it's fundamental to understand Cuba. What the Haitian Revolution does is a few key issues. Uh, in bullet points, first off, it's the one that truly embodies the universality of human rights. If you go back to the Declaration of the, French, the Rights of Man and the Citizen of 1789 of the French Revolution, the emphasis there is on the word citizen, is not on the word man. As a matter of fact, of, out of roughly 24 million French denizens after 1789, 4 million French citizens could vote. Most French denizens were passive citizens, not active citizens, after the French Declaration of, of uh, Rights of Man and the Citizen. It is only with the Haitian Revolution that the shift, the emphasis shifts from citizen to man. How? Number one, of course, through the abolition of slavery. And the other, that's the main element. The second element is uh, in terms of the geopolitical transformation of the Americas. It is thanks to uh, the Haitian Revolution that Napoleon radically transforms its own imperial agenda. After his brother-in-law uh, loses the battle, the war in Haiti, he decides to let go of American possessions and focus on Europe. As a result of that, you have, of course, the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, which gives the US half the size, well, it doubles the size of the US at the time. And crucially, you have the Peninsular War of 1807-1808 in Spain. Napoleon occupies Spain between 1807-1808. As a result of that, you have Latin American independence between 1810 and 1825. That is the first, if you want to in geopolitical terms, it's the first moment of global victory of the Westphalian Compact, right? The Peace of Westphalia 1648, which is the one that establishes according to many scholars, the framework of the current nation state. Between 1810 and 1825, all of Latin America becomes independent with the exception of two islands, Cuba and Puerto Rico. We'll let Puerto Rico be for the time. We'll go back to Cuba shortly. Uh, what is also to be mentioned crucially is in the same moment in which Latin America becomes independent, the U.S. exerts the Monroe Doctrine, 1823. And the key question to you is, can you imagine why does Cuba not become independent? Because of sugar and slavery. Cuba had become, after the Haitian Revolution, the main sugar producing facility in the world. And as the Ferrer piece uh, clearly shows, in the history of slavery in the US between 1619 and uh, the middle of, well, the early 19th century, there are roughly 530,000 slaves that were imported. The more than that number were imported between 1816 and 1867 in Cuba. In 50 years, roughly 600,000 slaves were imported from Africa to Cuba. So in 50 years, as many as in 400 years in the US, which means that the uh, racial demographic of Cuba was transformed dramatically. And the Cuban elite was extremely afraid of the so-called Haitianization of Cuba, meaning by that of the whites, of the black slaves taken over. As a matter of fact, it is only after the US Civil War that Cuba opts for independence. That's a, a historical feature that is not very much recounted. The annexationist push towards the US slave holding South was very strong in Cuba because wealth, modernity, and progress was, were embodied in the sugar industry and in slavery. Only when annexation no longer becomes possible 
you have the first attempt at Cuban independence, which is the so-called Ten Years' War, 1868 to 1878, whereby Carlos Manuel de Céspedes, which is known as the father of the nation, frees his slaves, asking them to fight for independence. Of course, asking is a very polite way to see forcing them to fight for independence. And there we have the failure of the first attempt, and then we have the second attempt, which is foregrounded in Martí's Our America. Why did I assign this piece, Nuestra America by José Martí? Because this, to me, this piece is one of the foundational pieces of uh, political thought in the 19th century, and in particular in the Americas. The main sentence of that article, to me at least, is one fundamental phrase. The colony lives on in the Republic which means that one of the challenges that all post-colonial nations face, both in the Americas between 1810 and 1825, in Cuba when it will become independent, in successor states in Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa with decolonization after World War II, the main one of the fundamental challenges is that the institutions that govern the polity were shaped in the colonial encounter. And one of the most dramatic challenges of any post-colonial society is the obligation to reshape its own political grammar, to find its own political grammar away from the grammar of empire. And I will argue uh, on April 23rd when we meet that for good and for bad, the Cuban revolution is no perfect revolution the Cuban revolution is a rare instance of a country achieving its own political grammar. Uh, when Martí is writing his essay, he foregrounds crucially a precondition for independence, which is nation building. In order to achieve independence, Cuba needs to create its own political grammar. The political grammar that Martí identifies is the transcendence of race. Not racial equality, but the erasure of race as an issue. He's being quoted in reality, uh, someone else who said it, but he's being quoted as saying in Cuba, we are not blacks, whites, or yellows. Yellows because there was a strong Chinese school immigration starting in 1847. We are all Cubans. The idea that nation must trump and transcend race is the idea around which Martí congeals nationalism and nationality in Cuba. What is fundamental is that Martí writes this piece in 1891 and Cuba is the penultimate country in the Americas to abolish slavery in 1886. He's writing this piece only five years after the abolition of slavery. He's of course not crazy. He knows that racism exists in Cuba. He knows that racial inequality exists in Cuba. What he's doing, however, is what in the words of, J uh, of Austin would be a performative utterance, right? He's trying to bring into being a reality that is not there Yet, that reality, Cuba is about to achieve independence. In the uh, Cuban War of Independence, 1895 to 1898, Cuba fights, uh, wages war against Spain. It is about to win independence when on February, if I'm not wrong, February 21st, 1898, the USS Maine explodes in the port of La Habana. As a result, the US enter the war, and there is a fundamental and fascinating uh, sanitizing of history. The Cuban War of Independence becomes the Spanish-American War. It's not only a resignification or resemantization of the conflict, it's also an erasure of the conflict. The Spanish-American War lasts three months. 
the Cuban War of Independence is thus automatically translated into the Spanish-American War. A three-year three conflict is translated into a three-month conflict. And that becomes the moment not only that signals the end of one empire, the Spanish empire, and the origin of a second empire, the US empire, but it's the moment in which the political grammar of empire, we're talking about the US now, is shifted, is created, is shaped. That's what uh, Lou Perez Jr., which is one of the most noted Cubans on uh, historians of Cuban history, uh, on Cuba, uh, uh, names or terms the debt of gratitude. The U.S. present themselves as having given independence to Cuba and Cuba being obliged to embrace the gift of gratitude. As those of you who have studied, who have read Marcel Mauss, The Gift, you know that there are gifts that are so big that cannot be counter-gifted. And of course, independence would, would be uh, pretty high in the list that positions Cuba in a very peculiar situation. Whereas Cuba was uh, achieving independence, achieving a new idea of the nation, the black population fighting in Cuba's independence war 1895 to 1898 was extremely large. Cuba was the second country in the Americas in terms of black generals. 17 black generals were fighting for independence in Cuba between 1898 and 1890, uh, sorry, 1895 and 1898, that agency is silenced. The result of US intervention is that at the peace treaty in Paris in September 1898, it is the US and Spain that sit. Cubans are not invited to the negotiating table, not even as participants. That is of course, a sanitization, a silencing of Cuba's presence in the conflict, of Cuban's agency in the country. What that does is it opens the, go the gates for, US, for direct US intervention. The most clear embodiment of that is the Platt Amendment. The Platt Amendment grants the U.S. the right to intervene in Cuban affairs whenever the U.S. deems it necessary for the benefit of the Cuban population. And the precondition for independence in Cuba is the incorporation into the Cuban Constitution of 1902 of the 1901 Platt Amendment. So as Perret beautifully puts it, independence becomes, or well, that's my wording about Perret, what Cuba achieves in 1902 is a de jure independence, but not de facto independence. So much so that in Cuba still today, when something bad happens to you, people say, Te cayó un 20 de mayo. A tw um, 20th of May has fallen upon you. May 20th, 1902 is Cuba's official day of independence. It is one of the very few countries where independence is certainly not celebrated because it was set against the attempt of the Cuban nation, shaped by Jose Martí, to create its own political grammar, to create its own destiny. U.S. intervention thwarts it, so much so that the first president of Cuba, Tomás Estrada Palma, had two hats. On the one hand, he was a prominent uh, general in Cuba's independence war, the one that had been silenced by U.S. intervention. On the other hand, he was also U.S. citizen. And he's the first one to call the U.S. to intervene in the island based on the Platt Amendment. The U.S. supposedly leave Cuba in 1902. They re-intervene re in Cuba between 1906 and 1909 because of Tomás Estrada Palma. The U.S. will intervene subsequently in Cuba for another two times until, of course, in 1934, you have FDR's good neighbor policy. The imperial grammar of the U.S. changes in a way, but what does not change is the dramatically uh, 
or the very intimate connection between the US and Cuba. What, with what I've spoken about until now is geopolitics. But US intervention in Cuba transforms the urban structure and infrastructure of Cuban cities, in particular of La Habana. It transforms the Cuban educational system and the Cuban medical system, improving them dramatically. And it percolates into each and every facet of everyday life. Cuba's national sport today is baseball because it was imported by two brothers uh, who practice baseball in the US. Uh, names in Cuba are a fascinating topic. Uh, a, key, a keyhole where you insert the key to open a door in Cuba still today in 2020 is known as un yale. Yale is the Cuban, uh, the Spanish rendition of Yale, which was not only a university, but a corporation that made key locks in the US. Uh, the, there's a male name, which is Usnavi. Usnavi is the Cuban alliteration for US Navy. There's a female name, which is Yumis Ladies, which is the lady from the Yuma i.e. the lady who one day will get to the U.S. The Yuma would be the U.S. That tells you a very intimate relationship between Cuba and the U.S. A relationship that develops between uh, way before Cuba's independence, the moment in which the relationship between Cuba and the U.S. is uh, de facto enacted is uh, when the Brits take La Habana in 1763 and open up commerce between Cuba and the US. But the most intimate relationship is built uh, from 1902, well, from 1899 to 1958. That's the moment of most uh, radical connection between the US and Cuba. That is a moment in which all Cuban presidents between 1902 and 1940 were vetted by the US ambassador to Cuba. And all of them had a double hat. There were, most of them were heroes of Cuba's uh, war of independence and were vetted by the US, which means what? The past itself becomes what I term a mythical poetic reservoir, meaning by that it becomes an unfulfilled reservoir to which the Cuban revolution after its occurrence in 1959 will always harken back as a site of legitimation because the past was never fulfilled. That is the narrative that the Cuban revolution built itself on and that we'll tackle uh, in a few weeks from now. The transformation of Cuba's society, for which there were no assigned readings because uh, I didn't want to give too much uh, things, too many things to read, between 1902 and 1958 is dramatic. A country that was achieving the transcendence of racial inequality is liberated, as Ferrer puts it, by a segregated army. So segregation comes back through U.S. intervention again. Dependency on U.S. aid becomes dramatic. In 1921, Cuba is the country that receives most FDI from the U.S. in the world. And it will be the country that receives most FDI from the U.S., broadly speaking, between 1902 and 1940s uh, and World War II. 1939. What that does is it creates a disconnect between the Cuban people and the political process. They see that the electoral process voting does not lead to self-determination. The frustration of self-determination that was produced by U.S. intervention in 1898 is diluted until 1958. That is the narrative that the Cuban revolution gives. And that's a narrative that it's relatively accurate, I would say, uh, 
by Cuban standards. What is very telling, of course, is that Batista, which was the uh, dictator that Castro toppled, many, in part also rightly, might say that Castro was a dictator, but we'll talk about that next, in a few weeks from now, not today. Uh, going back to the issue that creating its own political grammar for Cuba has been both extremely successful and extremely problematic. Uh, Batista was legally elected in 1940, from 1940 to 1944, and then he performed the coup d'etat in 1952. The coup d'etat that he performs in 1952 is the trigger to Fidel Castro's first uh, armed attempt at independence, based upon which you have uh, the assigned readings, uh, history will absolve me. On January 26, sorry, July 26, 1953, Fidel, Raul, and others performed the failed attack on the Moncada barracks. The Moncada barracks were the second military barracks in Cuba, they're in Santiago de Cuba, the Cuba in the eastern part of the island, and they miserably fail. That moment is a foundational moment of the Cuban revolution. That is, in Cuban revolutionary historiography, the foundational moment of the Cuban revolution, which allows me to touch upon a fundamental issue that will be uh, more clear uh, next time we meet, which is that Cuba, uh, the Cuban Revolution is not an event that occurs in 1959, as it is very often portrayed in US media. It is a process. Like any revolution, it's simply not an event that occurs. It's a process that has multiple genealogies. The Cuban Revolution produces its multiple genealogies, starting harkening back to 1868, to the Ten Years' War of Independence. But the foundation, the, the most often referred to founding event of the Cuban Revolution is the failed attack to the Mercado Barracks in 1953. Why? Because as we all know, martyrdom, failure, uh, national crisis is very often foundational in the history of nations. I'm thinking of uh, the Serbian case of the Battle of Kosovo Polio, 1389. Uh, I'm thinking of, uh, I'm not going to go in, in, uh, on that line, but there's, that is in Cuba for the Cuban revolution, the foundational moment. What the other thing that I would like to add on Fidel's uh, discourse is, of course, uh, Fidel uh, was a self-trained lawyer, uh, the son of a very wealthy landowner. And the document you have encountered is a programmatic document uh, that sets the stage for what will occur in 1959. The six points that Fidel outlines in terms of broadening access and rights, broadly speaking, will be the backbone of the 19. 59 revolution and of the two years of guerrilla warfare between December 1957 uh, and January 1959, sorry, December 1956 and, and January 1959. But there is a fundamental difference between that document and the actual guerrilla war. When Fidel wrote that document, he was, to put it uh, in eloquent terms, a spoiled brat. He was the child of uh, a wealthy landowner. He had gone to Jesuit school. He was a law student at the University of La Habana, which is one of the most prestigious universities in the Americas, being founded in 1728. He had, despite having been born in the eastern part of Cuba, the poorest part of Cuba, he had relatively little direct experience of rural life in Cuba. It is only during the guerrilla phase of uh, the Cuban Revolution that Fidel concretely experiences the radical inequalities between the urban and the rural framework of Cuba. Uh, 
that's a fundamental feature that will shape the Cuban revolution from 19, 1959 onwards. The Cuban revolution from 1959 onwards will be a revolution fought against cities and in favor of the rural countryside. To give you a simple example, in 1980, in the 1980s, you could have open heart surgery in more cities in Cuba than in the US. That went, of course, to the expense of the city of La Habana, of the infrastructure of the city of La Habana, which we'll, go, uh, we'll touch upon next week. And maybe this is uh, a moment for me to stop and take a few questions or comments, because the issue is I do not know what the class structure is. I do not know if anyone or some of you or all of you have done the readings and what your concerns about those readings are. My objective now was to give you kind of a brief aperçu of Cuba's history before the revolution, uh, of the nation before socialism. Because as we'll see next week, of course, the Cuban revolution is first at heart a nationalist revolution, not a socialist revolution, right? Fidel Castro declares the socialist character of the Cuban revolution on the eve of the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. When the Cuban revolution occurs in 1959, he does not speak of socialism. He does not speak of communism. As a matter of fact, Cuban historians agree to the fact that Fidel was not a socialist or a communist. The one that was a communist was his brother Raul, but not Fidel himself. Yeah, let me, let me start because exactly I was going to ask about, about this question, uh, this, this last issue that you raised. Uh, I mean, almost everything in, in the story you tell and in terms of the, the first half of the readings uh, indicates that, uh, that Cuba, uh, the problem is the national problem, nation building on the one side and national emancipation on the other side, and the two are uh, are not the same uh, because of the internal division uh, 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 in Cuba, reinforced then by the uh, by the American uh, American period. So, nation building: how you create a body of equal members uh, of a population which is divided. At the same time, how do you emancipate uh, from the United States, which is a related uh, matter? Uh, 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 is, uh, uh, is, is in the forefront of, of, of all, uh, all the readings. Uh, and I'm aware of this interpretation that, that you gave, uh, which is, I think, even the United States pre-standard, that, uh, that the socialist turn is, uh, is later, uh, uh, Bay of Pigs, uh, but also, of course, the U.S. foreign policy uh, and the fact that the Soviet Union was... Uh, uh, was more supportive and uh, and open uh, uh, to the transformation of Cuba. These are the things usually are mentioned in that particular context, and that's pretty much how I I uh, uh, have uh, understood understood the story, for better or for worse. Uh, but listen, reading that very interesting speech, history will absolve me. And I heard of this speech before. I don't think I ever read it uh, 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 as carefully as now. Perhaps I never read it, and this is the first opportunity where I had a chance to read it. It's extremely famous. Uh, uh, and, you know, the man expected to be probably executed as a result of it. And it's through uh, various uh, historical accidents, but also international uh, 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 roles. The Mexican government, for example, playing a role that that doesn't happen and he gets to live. Uh, so it's really a very, very authentic and honest speech expressing his views at the time. Now, you know that socialism has many meanings. And of course, it's not exhausted by the people who use the term socialism. Reading that speech of, uh, of Castro, uh, I see a lot of fundamental issues that socialism has raised, that is, uh, if you reread the speech carefully, uh, 
the national issue is present. It's present, but it is not the overriding interest. The overriding interest is emancipation of peasant and worker. Uh, that seems to be, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, that means, uh, 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 of course, uh, the shift you mentioned uh, from the city to the countryside to an important extent, but there are things to be said here about urban workers too. So it's not as if there is a no, no interest in them. So, so clearly, uh, whatever his, uh, uh, and I have not read ever a biography of, of Castro, probably it would be important to read uh, those biographies now. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, Raul, in any case, was a socialist already. I don't know if the relation to Guevara is later or earlier, but he has, uh, I think, yes, Guevara has, was in the mountains with him too. So, oh, yeah. there, are, so there are socialists uh, 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 in the camp uh, fighting together, right? But this, is, this speech is earlier than that. It's 52. 53, yeah. And yet I think it indicates uh, uh, a, a, an interest in in equalization on land, which of course in some versions of socialism uh, uh, is rejected because uh, you don't want to have small peasant agriculture, uh, but other versions of socialism accepted. And we discussed, for example, in this class, the new economic policy. So in the history of even the Soviet Union, there are periods uh, uh, in which uh, uh, redistribution among small property holders in the countryside is the dominant dominant model. So it seems to me that in, in some interpretation, there's a strong dose of socialism in the in the Fidel speech. Maybe he doesn't in, even know it himself, or maybe he would not have stressed it. And now, if that is true, then the question is why. And one classical answer would be the Marxist one with Bahara, who is there somewhere. I don't see a picture of her, but she's among the people. She, she and I are, are running a class on historical sociology, and we spent uh, the last session on imperialism, uh, profiling uh, various theories, but I think paying a lot of attention to Lenin's uh, classical text. And if you interpret Lenin, uh, you, you know, at least one interpretation, surely the one that Mao is going to give, is that uh, uh, the road to socialism internationally is through national self-determination and peasant emancipation. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, uh, one interpretation would be that Castro has nowhere to go really intellectually, given the context, given imperialism, given that he has a peasant country, of course, very different than China, every peasant country is different. But still, the givens are such that the Leninist option uh, is natural. And that's one, uh, uh, one interpretation. The other one is, uh, uh, would be a social psychological one, is that, that the, uh, the, uh, the abuses and the poverty that he describes are so great that, that a nationalist in such a setting uh, uh, cannot avoid the social question, cannot avoid the social question. So that would be another interpretation. But I'm wondering what your interpretation is, because it's, it's, it would be possible in historiography to, uh, to interpret the revolution, even of, of, of the 1958-59 one, as first and foremost uh, nationalist. One sees a lot of elements of what is called populism in the current literature uh, in the discourse. And yet there are some very significant socialist elements which could be interpreted tactically or it could be interpreted deterministically, but could also be interpreted as, uh, uh, as uh, an inevitable part of national liberation in, in, in such a setting. It's, by the way, not automatic because if you look at various African countries, uh, uh, you will see a competition between social revolutionaries and national revolutionaries. And I'm sure even the Cuban revolution this was a competition. As you say, Raul is one way, Fidel is the other way. So even within the family, the emphasis is different uh, at a certain point. But that it is so present in his speech, uh, uh, I think it's a uh, thing to be, to be interpreted. And I don't mean the word socialism, which is unmentioned in the speech, uh, or even uh, uh, social revolution, but rather uh, uh, the presence of so many social issues, uh, 
and one simple way of putting the question is, is the switch to socialism contingent and a result of stupid American policy and, and more intelligent uh, Soviet, uh, in that particular case, uh, uh, already Khrushchev's uh, uh, far, foreign policy? Is it contingent like that? Or is it really kind of inherent in the logic of a national revolution in a setting like Cuba that it becomes socialist? You know, Hannah Arendt wants a modern revolution to exclu exclude the social question. You could not exclude the social question in a country like Cuba. Okay, so if you could address it, and then we'll open it to the uh, rest uh, of the press. And I'll call on people after you. It's a very uh, loaded question that I, can, I will try to address briefly, uh, but there's many aspects to it. Uh, I would agree more with the second uh, reading that you gave, which is that the social question cannot be avoided, rather than Fidel having no, that Fidel Castro having no other way to go to but socialism. Why? Because he has, the social question is fundamental. Cuba was one of the most unequal societies in the globe at the time. La Habana was one of the wealthiest cities in the world. And the rural countryside was extremely poor. Literacy rates, educational, I mean, it's the rates, the numbers are staggering. The why, the reason why the path to socialism, uh, as we frame it today, as we read it, uh, was not there yet, is because the way Fidel frames his action is as the vindication of the absence of self, of the lack of self-determination. Fidel sees himself always, and he puts it also in History Will Assault Me, as the heir to Jose Marti, as the one that will fulfill the broken promise, that will lead Cuba to self-determination. The crucial issue is that it's a self-determination that is looking at the past, at 19, 1898, number one. And yes, uh, Fidel, Raul, and Che Guevara meet in Veracruz in Mexico. That's where they buy the boat grandma uh, from a Texas, uh, a wealthy Texan. They take the boat, they bring it to Cuba, the landing of the boat will give the name to a, pro a Cuban province, Granma, which of course means grandmother. Uh, and the Cuban national, uh, the Cuban communist journal is known, the name is Granma. Fidel, uh, sorry, Raul and Che were communists, had clear, a clear understanding of, of communism and socialism. Uh, We'll read next week, or well, whenever we meet again, we'll meet uh, Man and Socialism by Che Guevara. Fidel did not have that reading, and the clearest expression thereof is that his allegiance to socialism is tactical, I would say. Cuba, of course, also because of the Cuban Missile Crisis 1962, was never a member of the Warsaw Pact. Cuba only entered the Comic-Con in 1972. Cuba, the 1960s are a fundamental decade in Cuban politics, are a moment of radical uh, experimentation away from the Soviet model. Cuba managed to maintain uh, a severely discreet uh, independent foreign policy. Cuba intervened in Angola, in Ethiopia, in South Africa against the expressed wishes of the Soviets. So uh, I would say that, yes, I agree with you. So the social question cannot be avoided and the social question is at the origin of Fidel's writing, history will absolve me. Going back to what I said before, this is a declaration. The Cuban revolution, the events of 1959 is, are what will make the declaration turn it into reality and will make it much more experiential. 
and we'll see why in a few weeks from now. Only after that, Fidel with uh, theatrical performances and moves will make of two Cubas one. There's a fundamental meeting, it's known as the Concentración Campesina, the, the peasant gathering, whereby on January 26, on July 26, 1959, July 26, of course, is the recurrence of the failed attack on the Mercado Barracks, Fidel will invite all peasants from Cuba to go to La Habana. Habaneros will host peasants in, his home, in their homes. Fidel will open up hotels to the peasants and will make for a few days an incredible encounter of, of sorts between the bourgeoisie of Cuba and the peasant countryside. So emancipation is emancipation against the US. Self-determination is self-determination against the US and in order to achieve, as you were saying, uh, the social question to transcend inequality. Those are to me the main uh, objectives that Fidel has in 1953 that will become more fleshed out uh, from 1959 onwards. Uh, just uh, briefly summarize what I'm, I hear you saying. So uh, number one, the first issue is the national one. But given Cuba at the time, the social question could not be avoided. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it tactical because the man is probably before his execution when he says all that. So, so in a way, this is a deeply moral uh, taking of stand, right, the, around the social question. But the social question is not socialism, is what I hear you saying. And there are different alternatives, uh, policies leading out of that. And even to the extent that Cuba joins the social, socialist bloc, which is only partial, as you say, even that is not pre predetermined, nor is state socialism predetermined uh, to adopt a model of nationalization of every major industry and collectivization on land, which did occur at one historical moment, at least. Now, later on, of course, it was transformed. Uh, that was not predetermined. That, that those elements come from, from, to some extent, geopolitical conflicts and to some extent the internal development, because you didn't mention the Cuban Communist Party, but it is a factor in his calculations. It doesn't support the uprising initially, but nevertheless becomes a supporter of the new regime subsequently. So in that sense, there are also internal reasons, plus his close allies, how can, who can be closer than his own brother. So there, is, there are pressures, but it is not predetermined, is what I hear you saying. Exactly. When I was referring to tactical, I meant after the revolution takes place vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union in the 60s and the 70s, not before, not in the 50s, for sure. And also, the other thing I will add, we'll talk about it when we meet next time, fundamental in the shaping of socialism in Cuba and of the combination between revolution and nation, which is an articulation that occurs after 1959, is the state of siege. Let's say the siege mentality, obviously. The US imposes the embargo, has the Bay of Pigs invasion, the missile crisis. Uh, the Cuban Communist Party is a very interesting story because there are different Cuban Communist Parties. One in the 20s that then gets erased. The Cuban Communist Party that we know today is founded in 1965. It's only 1965 that Cuba becomes a one party system. There were different social and political movements until 1965. And that, why? Because 1965 is the year of most radical isolation of the Cuban revolution. 1962, Cuba is expelled from the Organization of American States. And 1965 is the year in which Chile rescinds diplomatic relations with Cuba, and Cuba holds diplomatic, diplomatic relations in the Americas only with Mexico and Canada. That's the moment in which centralization, state of siege mentality, become a key tool in the construction of the revolutionary discourse. But that's for next week. Okay, thanks a lot. That's terrific. Uh, the floor is open now. To... Who wants to start us off? Well, I do have a question about um, the healthcare system of, the, uh, of Cuba. C of Cuba, but I don't know if this will, will be discussed in more detail in next session. So, uh, but yeah, 
but but I do have a question about uh, the significance. Uh, why is it that? Is it just because of the uh, social rights and and the, uh, the 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 social rights that the healthcare system in Cuba is so you know advanced? And as you said, that in the 1980s there were more heart surgeries in Cuba than the U.S. Or does it have a is it a, a specific reason go, go, going back to the history of the country? So <clears throat> there's a few things to be said about that. We're not going to touch about upon it that much next ne next time we meet, uh, and it cert but we can certainly talk about it now also because it speaks to the current present, the, cur the current moment. It speaks also to COVID nineteen, of all things. Cuba has a very interesting uh, medical history. Number one, Cuba's medicine was very poor until U.S. intervention, as I mentioned before. When the U.S. intervened, they revamped Cuba's medical infrastructure at the beginning of the 20th century. When the U.S. leave, out of six, uh, when the U.S. leave, when, when, with the Cuban Revolution, 1959, out of 6,000 doctors that were present at the time, 3,000 leave the island. Still today, well, that was uh, uh, terminated by Obama. Until the Obama administration, there was the so-called Medical Parole Act, was one of the many tools of regime change that the U.S. imposed or proposed for Cuba and imposed on Cuba, which was that Cuban doctors were amongst the very few doctors in the world whose title would be recognized immediately by U.S. authorities in order to brain drain uh, medical resources from Cuba. As you may know, uh, Cubans still today are the only nationality in the world. They have a better relationship than Israelis to the U.S. that are granted the green card within one year and one day upon arrival through the Cuban Adjustment Act of 1966. So, it was a very small number of Cuban doctors that revamped the Cuban medical sector in the 1960s and progressively in the 1970s and 80s. Of course, the dramatic shift in the 1970s and 80s, as we'll see in a few weeks from now, is that uh, monetary subsidies were dramatically improved through Soviet intervention. When Cuba, when Cuba enters the Comic-Con in 1972, the U.S. Uh, the USSR starts funding Cuban enterprises at the tune of five billion dollars a year. We're talking about 1898, 1899 now. So dramatically, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the ensuing of the special period in times of peace, which is the dramatic economic crisis that Cuba is still under today, uh, there was a dramatic shift proposed by Fidel or decided by Fidel which he was to disinvest on sugar, from sugar and reinvest on two main economic avenues, tourism and biotech and medicine. Today, officially, the first line of Cuba's GDP in terms of export is the export of professional services. By far, number one, medical services. Then number two, sports services and other services, engineers, but by far, it's medical services. Cuba has therefore enacted, above all, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, what is known by scholars as medical diplomacy. It is through medical diplomacy, Cuba has been sending doctors through to multiple countries in the global south um, to underserved areas. That was the way to, in a way, export the Cuban revolution when the armed phase of the Cuban revolution, what Che Guevara tried to do in the Congo in 1965 and in Bolivia in 1967 was no longer possible. Cuba tried to export the ideals of the revolution through uh, medical diplomacy and of course, to improve diplomatic relationships with host countries. Uh, today, Cuba keeps on doing the same I'm half Italian, half Cuban, as, Italy, as Andrew was saying, Italy is the most severely affected a country by COVID-19 uh, to date. Probably the US will overtake it soon. Uh, Cuba sent doctors to Italy 
Cuba sent doctors uh, to West Africa during the Ebola crisis. Cuba sent doctors to France as well and Spain. They're sending doctors to multiple locations. They're sending doctors to Brazil again. Um, and Cuba made a lot of money to that, through that. So there's both the economic and the diplomatic elements that are key in uh, reestablishing a connection to the Washington consensus, right? When the Soviet Union collapses, Cuba is all of a sudden alone and it has to imbricate itself into, new, into the neoliberal world order. One of the ways in which it does so is through uh, the medical sphere, medical diplomacy, medical export, and uh, still today, it's uh, a very important feature of the Cuban economy and of Cuban politics. I wanted to ask you um, about something that really shocked me when I was in Cuba. Um, because we went to the to La Habana and I saw like this sculpture of Cristobal. And I also have a feeling that um, I'm from Spain. <laughs> so that... Um, as opposite than in maybe in other Latin American countries, uh, I was like Cubans were all the time trying to make connections uh, with Spain, with the Spanish people. Um, so I wanted to ask you, how do you think um, the Cubans um, configured the relationship with with Spain after the, the first independence? I would say that there was very little space in Cuba to uh, let go of Spain because independence did not translate into self-determination. It translated into de facto occupation by the US. Therefore, there was no possibility of creating that distance from what you had just left behind because Cuba was not able to create its own political grammar at the moment. So I would say that's something that still percolates in terms of the relationship to Spain. The other key element is that uh, there are two more key elements. Number one has to do with the Catholic Church. Most of, in most of Latin America, the Catholic Church is extremely powerful. In Cuba, it's very weak, not only and not so much because of the socialist character of the Cuban Revolution, but because the Catholic Church sided with the Spanish during Cuba's independence war. So it was on the losing end of history. However, in Spain itself, there is a very intimate connection to Cuba because, as you know, as we mentioned before, Spain lost most of its colonies between 1810 and 1825. And it was during the Spanish-American War that it lost its last three colonies, uh, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Cuba, and Guam. I think Guam was Spanish as well, I'm not sure. Cuba, uh, Cuba, Philippines, and Puerto Rico for sure. There's maybe Spanish Morocco. Yeah. And uh, Spain today has a very important law, which is known as the Memory Law, mm -hmm. that grants descendants of Spanish nationals, the citizenship. And of course, Cubans are dramatically jumping at it because it provides financial benefits. And it provides a very useful and nice European passport, right? Mm -hmm. So there is no uh, animosity against the Spanish because the enemy could not, was substituted by another enemy, right? The colonial power was substituted by a neo-colonial power. So there was no space to, to distantiate itself from it. And the last element that I would uh, mention is uh, that uh, relates more to the experiential dimension. As you know, the official slogan in La Habana in Cuba is socialism or muerte, socialism or death, but the unofficial slogan is socialism or muerte, which is friendism or death, right? the network of favors, what in China is known as Fang Xixie, in, in Russia, in Soviet Union was known as Blatt. In Cuba is, I would say, mm, probably more pervasive and more and stronger. It's certainly still very present today. And the result of that is that any foreign national is seen as 
an entry point or a conduit point for uh, the strengthening of one's network. You know, getting to know Spanish people might be a way out of the country, might be a way to make some money, might be an experience, might be God knows what. But as we know uh, from Janusz Kornheiser's Economies of Shortage, uh, when you have shortage economies in socialist countries and in Cuba even more, context matter more than money, right? Because context are what allow you to make do when money will not be of use because there simply is nothing to buy. And that's the situation that Cuba is witnessing as we speak because the COVID-19 crisis will probably affect Cuba financially more than uh, in terms of its healthcare, right? Cuba, going back to the previous question, is very strong in terms of preparedness when it comes to healthcare. They, uh, thousands of people have been interviewed. My mother lives in La Habana. So there are medical students going, knocking door to door, asking people if they have symptoms. That may happen in China. It certainly doesn't happen in Western Europe, right? in so-called Western democracies, COVID-19 is uh, it's a governmentalized disease. You are responsible for it yourself. If you feel sick, then you should approach a doctor, but the doctor will not come to you. In Cuba, it's the opposite. The doctor or the medical community or fraternity is coming to you to make sure that you're doing okay. And if you're not, try to take care of you. Okay, uh, so, so who's next? And just to add that- I, just, Yeah, you I can think, add another. Yeah. Yes, I think um, also Cuba a few days ago accepted a, a British cruise, right? With some infected people when Cuba had only like three or four infected people. Um, and yeah, the British government really appreciated that. <laughs> and they were treated in Cuban hospitals. I think. Yeah, they were also, um, they were allowed to dock and then board planes to, to the UK. Uh, there's two ways to look at, uh, at something like this. There's uh, another German flight, uh, a German airplane full of Germans that was allowed to refuel in Cuba also with uh, passengers sick with, sick with COVID-19. Uh, the people that look at it favorably say that this is an example of Cuba's its best. When other countries are shutting down, Cuba is reasserting the key issue that healthcare is a universal human right, which is the opposite of what happens in this country. If you look at the fact that healthcare is provided through your employer very often, if now you have 6.5 million people that file for employment benefits, that means that there may be 6.5 million people or several million people without employment, without insurance, without health insurance. In Cuba, the view is the opposite. Of course, there's also uh, a diplomatic aspect to it, which is Cuba is uh, severely isolated today because of the Trump policy and because of the island's own uh, economic inefficiencies internally. This is uh, a PR wonder that Cuba is doing, if you look at it in, in diplomatic terms, right? They're doing something very smart. The cost of it should not be that high. The likelihood of Cubans getting infected because they allow refueling a plane or transferring uh, sick passengers from a boat to the airport on buses, it's minimal, but the PR message is very strong. It's very powerful. You know, we are helping the first world countries. We're helping Brits, we're helping Germans. Uh, that means, again, it's a gift that we hope will be reciprocated. So when COVID-19 is out, we hope that the European Union will speak to Cuban interests, right? Solidarity. I really like your point about Cuba being lonely after the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, and my question is, uh, so like you spoke about US, Soviet Union, but what about the countries in the region? I mean, not like superpowers, but like neighbors of, of Cuba. I mean, like this, like Latin America countries, what about the relationships between like 
on 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 the like on the level on like I would say horizontal. So there's two issues to that. I would say, number one is uh, the timing of the Cuban Revolution itself, right? The Cuban Revolution. Uh, occurs in a crucial moment of the Cold War. After World War II, you have uh, the US shift in its policy within Latin America, less towards direct intervention, more towards covert intervention, mostly economic, but also uh, backing up uh, uh, right-wing military regimes. The real push comes out of the Cuban Revolution. The Cuban Revolution, 1959, leads to the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962, which is the one that will then dramatically isolate Cuba. 1962 is a crucial year for Cuba. Again, in January, is expelled from the Organization of American States. In October, you have the Missile Crisis. And the US and what the Soviet Union had clear was that the proxy wars between socialism and capitalism were not to be fought in Latin America. Were, they were to be fought in Asia and mostly in Africa, but certainly not in Latin America. It was too close. And obviously, as we know, the secret negotiations between Khrushchev and Kennedy led to the US withdrawing its nuclear warheads from Turkey and the Soviets withdrawing its still to be nuclear warheads from Cuba and the agreement that the US would not directly intervene in Cuba, as it had done with uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion. What the US then does is to try to isolate Cuba as much as possible, pushing both the right-wing agenda in the Condor countries, so in, in South America, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and trying to sever relationships between progressive countries and the Cuban establishment. When Chile reestablishes relationships in 1970, the US intervened in Chile, and of course that will, let, will lead also to the suicide of Allende and Pinochet's you know, dictatorship. So the context of Cuba becomes extremely difficult um, throughout the Cold War. When the Cold War ends, and there would be the possibility of improved relationships between Cuba and the US, the US bet clearly on stronger regime change than even before. The embargo is hardened in 1992 and 1996. So the objective of the US is not to negotiate, but to sever the relationship with Cuba and force the Cuban regime to surrender. The only one that has tried to do something different is Obama, right, with the normalization of uh, relations between Cuba and the US. And paradoxically, that speaks to the state of siege mentality that was mentioned before. One of the ways in which the Cuban revolution articulates its own political discourse is we have to be one. We have to be homogenous. The new man of socialism that we'll read in a few weeks from now it's a man that does not allow internal critique. Where difference, above all in the 70s and the 80s, is seen as dissidence. The worst years of uh, the Cuban Revolution are, it's known as the Great Quinquennium, 1970 to 1975. That is a period in which alternative worldviews within Cuba are not really tolerated. But that is justified with the state of siege mentality. We have to resist. We have to be not only united, but homogenous. We have to all be equal. When the Soviet Union collapses, Cuba is forced to reinsert itself into the global economy. And there is when difference no longer become, means dissidence. There's a lot of word games in Cuba that's when the, the Cubans that left Cuba until 1990 were known as gusanos or worms. And then the Cubans say in the 1990s is when worms become butterflies because they fly back. Or the traidores become traidolares. The betrayers become 
dollar bringers. They bring dollars back. And even the official discourse change, changes from the scum and the warmth to the Cuban community abroad. And the idea of Cuba, the idea of the nation as such, is recast because it's no longer the island in Cuba, but it's Cubans within and outside of the island. For the first time in the 2019 constitution, Cubans from outside of the island were asked to give their opinion. That's a first since the Cuban revolution, right? The Cuban constitutions are 1940. There is a, a universal law of 1959, which is not a real constitution. Then 1976, which is a very socialistic constitution. And then 2019. For this constitution of last year, the meaning of Cuba and of the Cuban nation was recast as much broader. I don't know if that addresses your question or not. Okay, so yeah, okay. you have something to... So, yeah, actually, I mean, I meant more about the countries in the region. I mean... Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, the countries in the region were unable to... I mean, if you look at Haiti, direct U.S. intervention. If you look at the Dominican Republic, Trujillo. Uh, there was very little space to negotiate directly with Cuba. Very, very little, unfortunately. Can I ask a question, uh, Andrew? Yeah, Miranda, yes. Um, yeah, thank you, Gabriel. I, I have a question that's sort of um, more on the uh, looking at culture and the way that, um, I guess, museums or the when you're talking about a kind of nationalistic identity, whether that has been, um, whether you can trace that through any kind of cultural regimes um, as well. And the more contemporary point that made me think of this was just something I looked up again, which was um, in 2018, the, I forget the name of the decree, but the, the decree that was suggested by a number of artists um, in Cuba to be promoting censorship um, and that sparked a number of protests and that led to a number of um, arrests of various artists. And so I guess another part of the question is, um, in line with that, how has censorship, I guess, been been dealt with, or how has a kind of national cultural agenda been yeah, met, not just in 2018, but prior as well? Of course, the decree you're referring to is Decree 349. That was de facto a form of censorship that has been severely criticized by many Cuban artists and not only artists in the island. The issue of culture cannot be read outside of the state of siege mentality. Why? Because um, the founding years of the Cuban Revolution, the 60s, are the years on the one hand of radical experimentality, as we'll see in a few weeks from now, and on the other hand of the need to unify the country behind Fidel's agenda. The way he does that in the cultural realm is with a very uh, notable and notorious discourse, which is the discourse to intellectuals in 1961. The most often quoted sentence of that speech is with the revolution, everything against the revolution, nothing. Which means you can be critical of the revolution within the framework of the revolution. You can move the revolution in one direction or the other, but you cannot be critical of the revolution itself. And culture has abided overwhelmingly by this uh, agreement. Amongst the arts, the one that has been most transgressive is certainly theater, which is the one that, uh, by speaking through metaphor, has been able to be much more critical. And I think, if I'm not wrong, that I assigned a spectacular th theater play for, next, for the next time we meet, Manteca, uh, which speaks dramatically about the, the end of utopia of the Cuban revolution during the special period. But culture is left to its own devices until the early 70s. So there's a lot of, of, of difference. Where while the state of siege mentality is being created from above, from the top, Cuban intellectuals are experimenting with uh, alternative readings of socialism from Europe, from Latin America, from Africa, 
They're experimented with uh, sexual liberation, with gender liberation, with racial identity. What occurs, and I mean, we'll talk about it next time we meet, but in the 19, there's a very important event in 1970, which is the 10 million ton sugar harvest. When that harvest fails, the entire apparatus of the country is reframed. That is the precondition for Cuba joining the Comic-Con and for dissent being quashed. 1971, you have the law on bargaincy or, or idleness. So Cubans are no longer allowed to be simply idle. They have to work. And there is a lot of censorship, as I was referring to before, the great Quinquennium. There is a dramatic case of Alberto Padilla, a very noted poet, uh, who is forced to uh, accuse himself of polit uh, politically inappropriate acts. Uh, he had simply been critical. But that was a moment in which critique was not allowed. In 1976, together with the Cuban Constitution, you have the creation of the Cuban Ministry of Culture, which protects Cuban uh, artists, intellectuals. So 1966, you have, uh, 76, you have a new opening of the cultural sphere in Cuba. And the moment of dramatic rupture is the special period. Since then, it's been a, a game of, of cat and mouse, uh, whereby the state can no longer control and articulate the political discourse to core. Their ideology has been fragmenting because of the economic crisis. And again, dissidence has become difference. Uh, equality is no longer uh, the staple word. And in the cultural realm, uh, reality is much more varied. The 340, decree 349 was another attempt at the Cuban government to reclaim control of the political discourse about, around culture but it has not succeeded. De facto, there's many people that have flaunted the decree, it's been toned down. Uh, culture remains mostly hearkening back to the 1961 discourse of everything within the revolution. So the element of radically criticizing the revolution from outside is still not there, but that's not only tied to culture, it's tied to the fact that the elite, the bourgeoisie left Cuba in 1959 en masse. That, for example, that's not the case in Venezuela, right? There is no internal opposition in Cuba. And the opposition that you have, the political opposition that you have in Cuba is very fragmented. And uh, for good and for bad, uh, it has not been able to provide uh, an active political agenda, only a reactive one. It's reacting against what the Cuban government does, but it's not being able to provide an alternative political agenda. And also it's very tainted in Cuba because many Cuban dissidents are, in order to survive also, they are funded by the CIA or they have uh, alternative sources of funding that Cubans on the streets do not really like. Despite many Cubans being critical, in many aspects of the government. Uh, th thank you, Gabriel. This was really interesting. Uh, I want to go back to the beginning of your presentation. In the beginning, uh, you asked us a question about the unique colonial past uh, of the Cuban uh, Cubans, and you said that it was unique because, uh, among you know, other Spanish colonies in the Americas, uh, unlike other Spanish colonies in the Americas, uh, Cuba didn't gain independence. And you mentioned the impact of sugar boom and you know, the fact that they abolished slavery way later than the United States. I believe it was 1868, sorry, 1886. Um, I wanna ask, I, I, I don't think I got your point. Why, why was sugar, uh, uh, like why did sugar play uh, such an important role in not uh, gaining independence? Of course, uh, probably I didn't highlight it enough. As a result of the Haitian Revolution, 18 of uh, Saint Domingue was the wealthiest colony in the world. Haiti was the wealthiest colony in the world, was the sugar producing hub of the world. 
1804, 1805, when the Haitian Revolution succeeds, Haiti, independent Haiti, is imposed one of the most dramatic and draconian trade embargoes by France, which is also embraced by the US, by the UK, by all Western powers. So much so that Haiti will finish paying off its debt to France only in 1947. Uh, as a result, sugar disappears almost from Haiti and the new sugar production center of the globe becomes Cuba. Why? Because of proximity. Everybody speaks about the 90 miles that separate Florida from Cuba, but no one speaks to the 33 miles that separate Haiti from Cuba. So the French sugar masters in large part and uh, uh, slaves with high technical skills moved to Cuba, where sugar production was already very strong, but it ballooned after the Haitian Revolution. And with that, increased dramatically the import of slaves, as says 600,000 slaves imported in 50 years, which meant that for the Cuban white Creole elite, whereas most of Latin America was looking at Europe as a space of modernity, Cuba, the Cuban Creole elite, was looking at the US as a space of modernity, and was looking also in the, the two reasons why it did not opt for independence was number one, the fear of Haitianization of the black slaves taking over, of having Cuba turn into a second Haiti. And number two, because independence in Latin America, a fundamental feature is that uh, Simon Bolivar, when he starts the independence campaigns in 1815, he doesn't have money. He goes to Pétion in Haiti and asks for money. And Pétion says, well, we'll give you the money we do not want it back. We want, there's only one condition, free the slaves wherever you get. And that's something that is acknowledged in uh, Bolivar's discourse in Angostura. Uh, and the political grammar of Latin America is about transcending slavery in Bolivar's discourse, is about transcending racial inequality. Cuba was not ready for that at the time was simply not possible. So much so that a large part of the Cuban intelligentsia was annexationist. They wanted to annex, annex to the US so they called the South. Even more, the Cuban flag that we have today resembles the Texan Lone Star. It comes from there. The Cuban flag was made in the US, was brought down by Narciso Lopez, a Venezuelan born annexationist and a Freemason. When independence becomes a possibility for the Cuban elite, it's after the US Civil War, when they see that annexation is no longer a possibility. And then they say, okay, we opt for independence because Spain is the most backward empire. It's not giving us the independence, the, the financial strength that we need. And Cuba had already a lot of autonomy with respect to, uh, even before 1810, Cuba had a lot of uh, financial autonomy with respect of most uh, other Latin American colonies of Spain. So the, the connection to Spain was already relatively thin. Spain was not the problem. The problem was Haiti and annexation to the US. Continue on, on this last question because uh, uh, there's some uh, uh, puzzles uh, that, uh, that I have in terms of the motivation of the American uh, intervention. Uh, because uh, you mentioned really two things, and of course there is also uh, in the literature you gave us uh, at least the level of self-justification, which is a third thing. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, one thing is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, the economic aspect, and this would be what would be stressed in the tradition that uh, Mahara and I reconstructed last time, or yesterday for the other class. So in that sense, and we, of course, in the new left days, always heard of this, is that it is economic interests. Uh, United Fruit is always mentioned, right? But also hotel interests and other American interests that have been always behind uh, American imperialism. This is the export of capital, the creation of markets, uh, thesis, raw materials, also if 
to the extent that sugar is an important raw material for other industries. That's sort of one, uh, one thesis. You mentioned also, though, uh, the race thesis, that is the, the American South in particular, which is not necessarily the whole American regime, but a very significant part of it, is worried. Uh, and this is why annexation also comes up in this issue before the Civil War. The fact to have an independent Black Republic, a much more powerful and a wealthy one than Haiti, is a threat. And in this sense, you could see a motivation also to intervene in order to, to change this thing. And then the self-justification, which I suppose people could say is a pure rationalization, but it transforms imperialism in any case, namely the idea that the U.S. being the first post-colonial country has a role in the rest of the colonial world. And, for, you know, you cannot understand Wilsonianism, for example, without this motive, but Cuba comes before the Wilsonian the trust at the, uh, at the uh, peace conference. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, a kind of American ideological justification too is an additional uh, force uh, uh, behind intervening. And, and it leads to a particular outcome because even though uh, the United States retains its power, it also leaves uh, the imperialism before uh, the First World War and especially uh, around 1900 was an imperialism that occupies, that remains. I think Lenin, uh, uh, but many others, Hobson, Hilferding, explain why it must remain, why it's impossible to run an empire, if you, uh, an economically motivated one, if you're not politically constantly present. Now you could say the Platt Amendment indicates a partial continuation of that, but nevertheless, the US has left and uh, in that sense, its ideological claims remain more plausible than if uh, it continued in the pattern of the Brits and the French who perverted the mandate principle, which is maybe the same principle, but of course the mandates were colonies uh, uh, in effect, uh, uh, whereas Cuba is not exactly a colony, uh, right, in the, uh, 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 in the period of, uh, of independence. Uh, so. Uh, the neo-colony, if you want to call it neo-colonialism, perhaps is being invented in the American-Cuban relationship. Uh, but that, of course, means that the ideological factor is an important one on its own. So how would you uh, uh, disentangle the race, the economic motivation, and the ideological one? Is the economic one first and foremost primary, which is only colored by the other two, or are they relatively equal motives? in turning the Cuban War of Independence into an American enterprise. Do you have like two or three hours? I know, I know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, important and loaded question. So how important, let's put it in a very crude way, crude materialist way, how important is the economic dimension? Uh, is it really the most important in order to, uh, you know, to get a hold of the, uh, uh, the sugar industry uh, the sugar production, rather, is that really first and foremost and everything else is just sort of secondary? Or would you say other things are equally important? Okay. No, I would say other things are equally important. I would tie this in part to uh, the of Manifest Destiny, 1839. Uh, I would tie this to Cuba being the theater for what I was talking about before at the beginning of the, of the conversation when I mentioned the, the tropes of unthinkability and invisibility as key elements of the political grammar of the post-colony and of empire. The, it's the strongest uh, political grammar of empire is the one that becomes naturalized the one that becomes invisible. The language that is shaped, there's a very beautiful piece by Lou, per uh, by Lou Perez uh, called The Debt of Gratitude, which I can share if you want to, about how the meaning of democracy is shaped in the Cuban encounter. Democracy as a gift that the US gives to Cuba, that in order for it to be reciprocated, entails Cuba opening up 
its politics, its nation, its rhetoric, and its economy to the US. In other words, self-determination, which was the objective of Jose Marti, is only possible through assimilation to the US uh, imperial creed. That becomes the challenge. Uh, the US intervention in Cuba is the crucial precondition for the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, 1904, which is the one that really gives teeth to the Monroe Doctrine. We all know that the Monroe Doctrine in 1823 was de facto not uh, backed militarily by the US until 1895. The fleet that avoided European intervention in Latin America was the British fleet because it did not want France mostly and other powers to intervene in Latin America. The US did not have the manpower to implement it. It is that radical shift in how the empire creates its own political grammar, which is the grammar of rights, of democracy, of advancement, of generosity, of we being the first post-colonial nation that are giving freedom and democracy to the rest of the world, to the rest of the post-colonies, that is honed and shaped in Cuba. That is very beautifully put in, in that piece by Perez, which I did not share. Um, and it tells you in a way that self-determination, in Cuba self-determination is based upon US benevolence. It is, it can only occur when the US agree to it. It creates a very paternalistic relationship between the US and the former colonies. It provides a, a moral endowment to intervention, which you can see mutuated on the one hand on uh, Bush's exporting democracy, but also outside of, US, of the US realm in theories like uh, the responsibility to protect, right? That kind of grammar of who has the right to protect, who has the right to intervene for the betterment of another nation or another constituency. The Cubans argue, and I kind of believe, is dramatically honed in that encounter, in that uh, war. And the other element that I would add to that is that um, and that's made clear in the first page of the first piece that I assign, and I can even read it aloud because it's just one small paragraph, when he de facto is saying that Cuba is the privileged laboratory or experimental site of US imperialism, and that's where the US hones the methods of empire, and now I quote from page one, armed intervention and military occupation, nation building and constitution writing, capital penetration and cultural saturation, the installation of puppet regimes, the formation of clientele political classes, and the organization of proxy armies, the imposition of binding treaties, the establishment of a permanent military base, economic assistance or not, and diplomatic recognition or not, as circumstances warranted. And after 1959, great sanctions, political isolation, covert operations, and economic embargo. All that is American imperialism has been practiced in Cuba. And as you, to me, what matters is that imperialism has two sides, the smiley face of democracy and the stern face of uh, military and economic uh, impositions, right? But what Perez is saying is that Cuba is the theater for, for the articulation of this imperial grammar, which is very different from the imperial grammar of the Brits or of the French, because precisely is based on this, the Cubans would call it illusion of having left the neo colony. The, new, the US is as present as where the Brits, the Cubans would argue, of course. Now I'm, I'm, I'm wearing the mask of Fidel, right? And there is some truth to that. 
there's certainly some truth to that. In terms of the racial question, it is crucial. And the US did play a dramatic role there. As I mentioned before, uh, the liberating army is de facto a segregated army, but not only. The US imposed in 1910 the so called Ley Morua. Mr. Morua was a Cuban politician, which by his decree uh, illegalizes parties based on the color line. So Cuba had a critical mass of black fighters. They were known as the Mambises, and as said, 17 generals had fought in Cuba's war of independence. They had been promised land, education, citizenship. They had been given citizenship. 1901, the Cuban constitution does something that will only be reality in the US after 1961, 1965 with the Civil Rights Act. All Cuban males are allowed to vote, including black males. However, they're not given property titles. However, they're not allowed to participate in the political arena as much as they were promised to. As a result of that, they create the Partido Independiente de Color or PIC, the independent, the party of the independent party of color, to uh, bring forth the agenda of black emancipation within Cuba. As a result of the Ley Morua of 1910, in 1912, you have the massacre of the PIC, 5,000 members of the party and 5,000 black bodies are killed. Lynching occurs for the first time in Cuba in very small numbers coming from the US. And the black agenda de facto gets diffused until the Cuban revolution. What the Cuban revolution will do will be to take over black emancipation, but not through the lens proposed in 1910, as much as through the lens of uh, global equality. Because of course, the new man of socialism, since it's premised on equality and must go counter any type of difference, goes counter class difference, gender difference, and racial difference. And the living standards of the entire population of Cuba went up dramatically yeah. in the 1960s, but that's another story. Yes, I wanted to follow up on your last comment and ask you whether the, the, the outcome where we stand today has really achieved enfranchisement of the people of color in Cuba. And I'm not talking theoretically, which has happened, but has pragmatically or practically that happened. Uh, yes and no, right? Uh, the key issue is that the Cuban revolution is not an event but a process. Uh, I will say to this a few things. Number one, uh, and I will compare Cuba to the US even though that's not 100%, uh, it, it is relevant. The black body plays a crucial role in the shaping of the idea of the nation in Cuba because the black body fought for independence in Cuba in 1895 to 1898 and prior to that. The black body is absence, absent from the narrative of the nation in the US in terms of its agency. The Declaration of uh, Independence 1776 does not apply to black bodies. The pursuit of freedom and happiness applies to a very small segment of the population. Uh, Cuba is concretely achieving or tending towards achieving racial transcendence or racial equality, some sort of that in a very tumultuous moment. Remember, slavery is abolished 1886. Marti has this performative utterance against race in 1891, only five years after that. Then the war ensues. Then the US comes with a segregated army resegregation occurs with the Cuban revolution, you have the erasure of difference, the homogenization of society, that radical attempt. As a result of that, you have a dramatic shift in the livelihood of uh, rural populations and non-white populations. 
The wealth is redistributed in a very equitable way. There is a lot of wealth to redistribute because the wealthy landowners leave the country, many of them. If you go on Fifth Avenue in La Habana, which is modeled after Fifth Avenue in New York, you see the mansions of the sugar barons. They were first inhabited by their domestics, by their servants, right? And you have domestic servants that were trained into becoming house proprietors, house owners. You have the state providing March 1960, sorry, February 1962, you have Kennedy's embargo. March 1962, you have the rationing booklet in Cuba. Cuba has the longest uh, rationing system. In, Cu in Cuba, of course, they call it the supply booklet, not the rationing booklet, obviously, uh, whereby the population is given goods by the state. Today, it's very small. In the 1960s and 70s, it covered most of your needs. So the material well-being of the Cuban population is dramatically increased, of the black population in particular is dramatically increased. And there's a fundamental issue that Fidel does. He says, racism is not to be tolerated. Racism is not revolutionary. As a result of that, the discourse and well-being and social participation of the black population in Cuba improves dramatically in 1960, 1970s, and 1980s. The problem comes with the collapse of the Soviet Union, with the special period in times of peace, with the economic crisis. In 1990, Cuba loses, in, between 1990 and 1993, Cuba loses 35% of its GDP. Cuban citizens lose, on average, 20 pounds of bodily weight. Imagine each of us losing 20 pounds of bodily weight, right? As a result, the state itself partially withers. The meaning of socialism changes. It is partially reduced to welfareism, basic welfare for everybody. And what harkens back are two things. Number one, the capitalist means of accumulation, of private accumulation. Who has the money? Three groups of people. Those who have, that have nice homes, and whereas many blacks have been moved into nicer apartments, still whites owned more uh, fancy homes that they could rent out for a profit. Ownership of cars that was mostly concentrated in white hands, and the Cuban diaspora that sends remittances, that is overwhelmingly white. From 1960, from 1959 to the 1980s, it's 95% white. From the 1990s onwards, it's more mixed colors. Today, it's roughly 80% white. And of course, the money will be sent to white families. So what you have is a radical increase in inequality. And also fundamentally, we'll talk about that next week. There's a disjuncture between wage and income. State wages are one thing, but personal income is detached very often from state wage. And the black population is more tied to state wages. The other crazy thing, of course, a very fascinating thing, Cuba has two currencies, the CUP and the Cuban convertible peso. They're both soft currencies, which means they cannot be traded in international forex market. They have no legal value outside of Cuba. And the state wages are in CUPs, which gives you the irony of women and the uh, black human population being very prominent in terms of professional expertise. Cuban doctors, lawyers, engineers, 60% of the professional workforce are women. And a large percentage of the Cuban workforce, of professional workforce, are non white. But where the money is, is in Cuenta Provismo, self entrepreneurship, which was legalized in the 1990s again, and that's mostly white, and that's tied to private capital accumulation. So there you have a resurgence of racial inequality. And today there is for sure racism in Cuba. There is racial inequality, but I would say it, the story and the history, it's very different from the one that you have in the US. Segregation is far less pervasive. Uh, inequality is not at the levels that you have in the US. Uh, 
And simply the history is very different from the Haitian Revolution, its effects on the shaping of the nation, the percentage of black bodies in uh, demographically in Cuba is much higher than in the US. But there's many more features, you know, the, the census is self-descriptive. People tend to whiten themselves in the census. So the census will tell you today that there's roughly 65% of whites, 18% of uh, blacks and 12% of mulattoes, something like that. The numbers are probably not those. It's less white than the census says, but it's much, much more than that. It's a very loaded question. And the other issue, of course, is that Fidel Castro's policy was very good in terms of material uplifting and in terms of establishing social dynamics, but it was dreadful in the terms of putting the problem under the rug of race not being debatable. It was simply not kosher to speak about it. You cannot address it. And if you cannot address it, you let it fester under the rug. So when the economic crisis hits, there is fertile ground for racism to pick up again. Right. That would be my... I, I couldn't resist. Uh, I wanted to ask this since the beginning because it seems to me that Martin's vision of a nation that transcends race, it echoes to me a lot the, the, the French the French attitude. In France, they don't record any minorities, no religion in the state, because the state says you are French, it doesn't matter if you are from Africa, if you are from, uh, from Algeria, if you are from France, from Italy, from wherever France has accumulated people are. And to me, that, that looks like it's even way more nationalistic than if you restricted the definition of a nation to those that historically had a presence there, uh, even if you define it like in, in racial terms. So actually, to me, it, that sounds that it's more transcendent and more like equal, but to me, it sounds that even more nationalistic because it, it squashes, it eliminates any differences which are like relevant, but the state, because of its own definition, becomes oblivious and blind to it. Yes and no. Uh the, the, the description that you gave is very accurate to the French case, right? Yeah. In France, what you have is two things. One, based on the work by Michel Roft, who I was mentioning before, the Haitian Revolution, black agency is unthinkable, which is crucial. And that leads, in the modern French state, to a sort of erasure of black agency, which is by normalizing and saying that all citizens are equal, you're de facto silencing that space of agency. In Marti, the discourse is different. He says, we have to achieve racial transcendence through black agency, not through the unthinkability of black agency, but through black agency. Blacks need to fight for the shaping and the making of the nation. The most, uh, also, iconically, you see it in, of course, one of the most iconic means of symbolic consumption is currency, right? If you look at Cuban notes, on the one peso note, the lower the denominator, the most consumed the image is, of course, like Washington is $1. Uh, in the one Cuban peso note is Jose Marti. In the three Cuban pesos is Che Guevara. In the five Cuban pesos is Antonio Maceo. Antonio Maceo, known as the Bronze Titan, was a black slash mulatto uh, revolutionary leader of both the Ten Year War of Independence, 1868, 1878, uh, and the second one, 1895, 1898. That tells you how prominent the agency of the black body was in the shaping of the nation. So, in the, in the moment of Marti, I would argue that. Erasure and unthinkability, which to me are a key element of how the French shape their discourse, are not present in Cuba. That becomes more relevant maybe under Fidel, not in terms of unthinkability, but in terms of erasure, because race needs no, can no longer be addressed. Then the racial question becomes kind of sidestepped and thus erased. Right. 
Well, thank you very much. That was wonderful, Gabrielle, and very, very informative. And we're lucky because we're going to have you for another session uh, to talk about uh, uh, socialism of, uh, proper uh, in the Cuban context, for which you have given a wonderful uh, introduction. And, uh, and we look forward uh, uh, to you doing that. So thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Gabrielle. Thank, thank you. you all.